Okay, so we'll get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Sushma Cribs and I'm going to be moderating this session. Again, this is our ATS COVID-19 critical care. training forum. Uh, this, we've been doing now these critical care training forums for the last couple of months, uh, putting them together to try to bring the latest information about COVID-19 uh, to your doors. Um, so a big thanks to all the people on the slide who have helped put these sessions together, uh, particularly to our ATS staff, Lauren, Liz, Eileen, uh, Rebecca, without whom none of these would be possible. So just to kind of show you some of the sessions we've done in the past, uh, we've had a session on oxygenation vent management. Uh, we've done one on clinical presentations and challenges from hard hit areas, sedation, palliative care, end of life, um, care of patients from home to the ICU. Uh, we've done sessions on post-COVID, radiology, multi-organ failure in COVID, and medical education during COVID-19, and also a session on immune responses. So all of these sessions can be uh, seen on our website. Uh, here's the QR code you can scan uh, to look at archived PowerPoint slides and videos from these sessions. Um, and please give us feedback. Uh, we have been continuing to do this because the response has been so positive, but we would love to hear from you as to what sessions you think would be useful for you um, and what kinds of things you'd like to hear more about. So give us feedback, take the survey. Uh, you can also post ideas on the chat. Um, we will monitor those as well. So that brings us to today. Uh, today is episode 11, uh, where we're gonna discuss hypercoagulability in COVID-19. Um, and I'm very proud to have our presenters today uh, we'll start with Nicole Herbst, who is a pulmonary critical care fellow at Emory, and she will start with some case presentations, and then we'll move on to the other presenters. So, Nicole, you want to share your slide? Sure. All right. Can you, Sushma, can you see that? Okay, great. Okay, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm going to get us started with a couple of case presentations um, to highlight some of the clinical challenges that we've encountered with COVID and coagulopathy. So I'm going to jump right in. So our first case is a 55-year-old female who is a Jehovah's Witness with a past medical history of hypertension and fibromyalgia. She presented with one week of fevers, chills, and cough, very typical COVID symptoms. Um, and of course, her test was positive on admission. On arrival to the ED, her oxygen saturation was 80%. Um, she was placed on high flow nasal cannula and admitted to the NICU. Um, unfortunately, the next day, um, she was intubated for progressive hypoxemia. Um, consistent with severe ARDS with a PDAF ratio of 62 on 100% FiO2 and 16 of PEEP. Um, she required paralysis, proning, as well as flow lamp for refractory hypoxemia um, and received empiric treatment for pneumonia as well for her respiratory failure. On hospital day two, she also had a bedside ultrasound concerning for a left upper extremity DVT and was started on a therapeutic heparin drip. Um, and monitored very closely for bleeding given the fact that she was a Jehovah's Witness and had made it very clear that she would not accept blood products um, if she were to bleed. Her course was also complicated by oliguric renal failure requiring CRRT. So um, just to, to take an aside in terms of the labs that we've been monitoring for our COVID patients to try to assess their risk of uh, clot and coagulopathy, so uh, at the top here, we have the initial labs that uh, we're used to ordering, so D-dimer, fibrinogen, CRP, relative measures of inflammation, as well as INR, PTT, and platelet levels. And then next, for patients who we have on heparin drips, measuring antithrombin levels uh, to assess for resistance, as well as anti-10A levels to assess for um, therapeutic uh, levels. <clears throat> 
Um, and then on the bottom here, I included some, um, some more specialized measures and labs that we can get in certain circumstances for patients who maybe aren't doing well or we're a little more concerned about. And the first one I wanted to focus on was a way that we can measure um, levels of inherent fibrinolysis. And um, the way that we do that is through th thromboelastography. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to review this because this is something that when I started my month in the COVID unit as a, as a first year fellow, um, I was very unfamiliar with. And so the, the basic idea with thromboelastography is to get a measure of um, the, uh, how whole blood functions in terms of the coagulation cascade. And how it works is there is a small reservoir or a cup with a small amount of blood in it and a small wire that's in the middle of that cup. And depending on um, whether it's TAG or Rotem, which is the other brand um, that can be used, either the cup or the wires slowly rotates to imitate venous flow and a clot slowly forms on that wire. And we can measure the resistance and the weight of that wire to get a measure of clotting. And essentially what we get from this is a graphical rep representation of clot formation called a thromboelastogram. And essentially this gives us how long it takes the clot to form, um, how fast it forms, the maximum clot strength, as well as how fast that clot is then broken down by a body's inherent fibrinolysis. Um, people may have heard of this in the setting of surgery and trauma, and that's, this is where these tests are mostly used, usually to try to figure out what products to give somebody when somebody is bleeding. So for example, if the clot time is very prolonged, you might give somebody factors in the form of FFP. Um, in COVID, we're in the opposite situation where um, we're worried about somebody being pro-coagulopathic. And so what we really want to focus on for COVID is this fibrinolysis um, piece. And so when you, when you get a Rotem, Rotem is what um, we have um, at some of our um, hospitals at Emory, you get a whole host of numbers. But what I really want to focus on is this maximum lysis number. And that's what's really important. So, um, you know, in, um, normally your body has some measure of inherent fibrinolysis to, to balance um, your procoagulable factors. And so a normal level is 5 to 15. In a patient who's bleeding, if that level is high, above 15, um, one might make the decision to get something like transactemic acid. But um, in our COVID patients, we've been finding that sometimes it's very low, below the level of normal. And the concern is for something called fibrinolysis shutdown. So essentially, the body's inherent fibrinolysis system has just completely shut down and lost the ability to break down any clot that's present. And this has been described in ARDS in the past. So um, I wanted to uh, first do a question before we get back to our case. Um, and uh, the question is, does your institution have a protocol for giving higher levels of, therapy, of prophylactic doses of anticoagulation for COVID patients? And I'll leave the responses there, and, and Sushma will, um, I think, pull up the poll where people should be able to vote. We see lots of different answers coming up. Still working. Okay, so it looks like our answer might be A. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people, um, people's institutions are using D-dimer, which is also what we are using at Emory um, with a value of more than 3,000 in, um, instituting a sort of moderate dose prophylactic anticoagulation, as well as that, that triggering some further testing like ultrasounds to assess for DVT. Um, but I just thought it was it's interesting that not everywhere is doing the same thing and we don't yet have a clear standard of care for, um, you know, preventing uh, clotting or the best way to address the coagulopathy that, um, that we see in COVID. Um, other than we recognize that it's, um, 
it can be very clinically significant in many of our patients and trying to balance that risk of anticoagulation um, and risk of bleeding, it can be hard. Okay, so I think we can probably go on to the next slide. Okay, so I wanna bring us back to our case. So just to remind you, um, our middle-aged um, female Jehovah's Witness now with refractory hypoxemia. And I wanted to walk through her course a little bit on the background of a few labs. So her D-dimer um, that you can see in blue there, as well as that x ml, as I mentioned before, that's a measure of fibrinolysis that you get as a readout on the Rotem. And five to 15 is a normal value. So as you can see on hospital day two, her x ml is below normal but close. And over the next few days, um, it drops to zero. And her D-dimer is slowly uptrending at this time. Um, as I mentioned, she had that left upper extremity DVT on admission and was started on a therapeutic heparin drip. She had bilateral lower extremity Dopplers the next day, which were negative. And I will say over this time, from a respiratory standpoint, she had started to improve and come down slightly on her oxygen requirements um, on the ventilator. So it seemed to be clinically improving. However, on the 12th of May, um, um, progressed um, in the wrong direction. Unfortunately, had uptrending oxygen requirements um, that requiring 100% of FiO2 and 18 of PEEP, became more tachycardic. Uh, bedside ultrasound was notable for an enlarged RV, as well as concern for a left lower extremity DVT, which was new um, from the day prior when she had negative Dopplers. And this is on a therapeutic heparin drip, so I have a few for other labs. Uh, there, her hemoglobin was 12, which had been stable since admission, and most notably, her anti-10A level um, had been therapeutic since she had been initiated on heparin. So this is going to bring us to another poll question in terms of what um, people think the next step in management would be. And I'll let Tishma put up the poll. Okay, everyone could respond. Looks like a little bit more divided on this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we have um, a switching to a different anticoagulation anticoagulant is sort of just beating out some of the other options, but we do have um, a pretty good mix here. And I think this just speaks to the fact that these situations are really hard and when these patients are very sick, um, and we think that part of that is due to, um, in part, clotting or coagulopathy, that these management decisions get really hard when we're managing risks and benefits. Um, so I will go to the next slide to describe sort of what we decided to do in this situation. So as you can see here, I have that, that point on May 12th where her XMML went to zero and her D-dimer was continuing to uptrend. Um, the decision was made <clears throat> because of the concern for PE given the right-sided um, dysfunction on bedside echo as well as her sudden decompensation after initially improving. Um, the decision was made to go ahead and give TPA um, a 50 milligram dose um, as a bolus, and then another 50 milligrams over two hours. Her heparin drip was continued at this time um, at 500 units an hour. And as you can see, the in, TPA had the intended effect of bringing up her inherent fibrinolysis, her x ml um, up to above five. So it still was at the low um, range of normal, um, but at least we brought um, up inherent fibrinolysis to um, a more normal level. Um, she thankfully had no uh, bleeding, which was something that we were very concerned about um, given her history of being a Jehovah's Witness. And so it was not a decision that was made lightly, but um, given her sudden decompensation, um, TPA was given. And you can see that her uh, D-dimer continued to uptrend for several days before then also downtrending. And she was continued on a heparin drip for that time. So 
continuing on, so her oxygen requirements did slowly improve and she was extubated on hospital day 11. Um, shortly after that, transferred to the uh, floor and then home. She's had complete renal recovery um, and she was discharged on a Pixaban for a three to six month course for that uh, DVT. Um, she never did get a formal CT of her chest to assess for uh, PE, uh, given that she was already gonna be on therapeutic management and she was clinically improved. All right, so I'm gonna contrast that with um, a second case um, with a slightly different presentation. So this is a 58 year old gentleman with type two diabetes, not insulin dependent and obesity. Um, again, coming in with a very similar presentation and a positive COVID test. He was intubated in the ED for respiratory re distress and refractory hypoxemia. And again, also had severe ARDS despite um, you know, changes in uh, uh, vent management, also required paralysis, proning, and flow land, as well as impaired treatment for infection. Um, he did develop severe alias and abdominal distension, which, which limit us, limited us in further proning him, um, which was unfortunate because he had been responding quite well to that. Um, he also had an AKI with the creatinine peak of 2.3, um, but thankfully um, was making adequate urine throughout his ICU stay and did not require renal replacement therapy. So again, just to bring us back to these labs that we've that we monitor um, in COVID and, and try to make our best clinical decisions based on. Um, again, just bring your attention to the bottom of the slide. So previously we talked about how we can look at um, measures of fibrinolysis with TEG or Rotem. Um, I wanted to just take in a few minutes to take an aside on plasma viscosity because it's also something that I was not very familiar with going into, going into COVID and is now something that I've learned more about. So, I think the main question is why measure plasma viscosity in COVID? So obviously we know there's a lot of inflammation involved in COVID and this means increasing levels of fibrinogen as well as things we can't measure, you know, immunoglobulin, certain cytokines. And these are all large proteins that exist in the plasma resulting in increased viscosity. And, you know, the question is, is that um, level of increased viscosity reflect an increased risk of um, VTE? And a normal value is about 1.4 to 1.8. So to bring us back to our case with that information, um, so I'm going to go through this case on a background of a couple of different labs, so a fibrinogen and D-dimer. Um, just to make note, our assay um, for fibrinogen only goes to 1,000, and so when it's persistently 1,000, it's 1,000 or somewhere higher than that. I'm unfortunately, unable to tell. Um, so on hospital day four, unfortunately, still very refractory hypoxemia, um, he's really not doing well. And his D-dimer was slowly uptrending, despite the fact that it didn't quite meet our threshold um, for increasing his level of anticoagulation. We made the decision to go ahead and start um, sort of our level two um, increased prophylaxis, um, just given his clinical status and worsening. Shortly after that, his D-dimer went from being about 5,000 to over 20,000 overnight. Uh, we did bilateral um, lower extremity Dopplers and upper extremity Dopplers as well. Actually, they were all negative, but given the high concern for clot that we just weren't finding, he was started on a therapeutic heparin drip at that time. Um, and throughout this time, continues to have very um, refractory hypoxemia and was really on the edge of um, potentially needing ECMO, our ECMO team had been aware of this patient this whole time. So what I'm gonna add along the bottom here is his plasma viscosity. So as I mentioned before, that upper limit of normal is 1.8, um, and he, his was persistently elevated, initial value of 2.5. We had one value that the lab told us they couldn't run because it was so viscous that the machine malfunctioned while well, they tried to run it. Um, and it remained persistently elevated and his D-dimer, um, after initially coming down, after starting on the heparin drip, was starting to uptrend again. And at this time, um, as you can see, still on um, pretty high vent requirements with a P to F ratio of less than 100. And his other labs are noted there. Most notably, his anti-10A level had been therapeutic on heparin, 
And as we discussed before, um, we've been monitoring Rotem on him as well, and his XTEM ML, his measures of fibrinolysis, were normal. And so the concern for fibrinolysis shutdown in him was low. And this is his bedside ultrasound of his femoral vein. While his uh, formal DVT studies were negative, Um, you can see there um, just the visible swirling of blood in stasis, um, and this is something that really surprised me by ultrasounding a lot of COVID patients, something that I had seen occasionally before, but now is seeing very frequently, and the question is, what does this mean? Uh, and what this is called is spontaneous echo contrast, and this is what cardiologists are referring to when they call something smoke in the LA, um, but it hasn't really been well described. Um, to predict anything really in, uh, you know, extremity vessels. So essentially what it is is echogenicity in, of blood in the absence of contrast. And it's unclear right now what this, what this means, um, but we're hoping to look into this more to see if finding this on ultrasound might correlate with plasma viscosity or risk of, or risk of clot. So I'm going to um, pose another question based on that. So is bedside focus or point of care ultrasound a routine part of your assessment for VTE or coagulopathy in your COVID patients? Thank you for everyone responding. Looks like the majority have said yes. Okay. There are quite a few that have actually said no. Right. And I, you know, I think this is hard because there's a lot of things to take into consideration for this. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've been using a lot of bedside assessment of patients with COVID, especially as we try to limit um, exposure and PPE use um, with getting formal scans, but obviously, um, you know, you need to be able to trust your bedside assessment, and, and it's very time intensive to, to go sort of do a full focus exam on, on every patient every day. Um, and it's something that, you know, I think when I spend my month in the, the COVID ICU, sort of a combination of, of bedside assessments and getting formal assessments when our concern was still really high for clot, even if we weren't finding it on bedside exam. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's a um, it's not an, an easy question or an easy thing to implement. And then you're also having, you know, um, ultrasound machines sort of going in and out of rooms that need to be cleaned as well. Okay. And then um, to go on to our next question. So based on where we are in this case right now, what would be the next step in management that people would take for this patient? A lot of different answers. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. So, so again, I think just reflecting how difficult these decisions are, um, and for for both of these patients, you know, there was a lot of extensive discussion with the ICU teams, with hematology, with with the ECMO team to make sure what we were doing wasn't going to prohibit somebody from getting ECMO if they needed it. Um, and, you know, when people are just really sick and you're concerned about bleeding as well, um, these can be really hard decisions. So I'll sort of walk through the decision that, that we made for this patient. So we decided to go with plasma exchange given the elevated plasma viscosity um, and the persistently elevated fibrinogen um, and as you can see, you know, the fibrinogen levels and the D-dimer levels sort of drastically drop um, in the setting of getting plasma exchange. And the plasma viscosity does significantly go down, um, although not quite to normal, um, at least a little bit closer to the normal um, range, that upper limit, limit of normal of 1.8. And um, over these ne the next several days, the patient had decreasing requirements of FiO2 and PEEP was extubated on May 9th, which was hospital day 16, um, and four days after his plasma exchange was started. 
Um, his creatinine also returned to a baseline. He spent a couple of weeks in rehab and then um, is now home with his grandchildren. Um, and he completed a four-week course of apixaban as an outpatient because he never did have a diagnosed uh, clot, but he did meet uh, criteria for being on an, an increased tier of prophylactic anticoagulation. And associated with that um, is four weeks of um, apixaban as an outpatient. So one, one final question that I had, because um, it's something um, that I think is also something a lot of uh, institutions struggle with is, does your institution have a process for follow-up of COVID patients who are discharged on anticoagulation, either for clot or for prophylaxis? Okay, so it seems like most people um, are following up in some sort of specialty clinic. Um, both of these patients have just followed up with their PCP via virtual visits uh, thus far. Um, but I think this is a, a very good question, something that a lot of people are, are worried about when we're sending these patients, you know, who have been very sick back home. And a lot, a lot of medical visits now are completely virtual. And are, are we doing, you know, are we appropriately monitoring these patients? Um, and so I think every institution is approaching this in a different way. Um, but I think it's, it's something that um, it's important to consider how we're managing these patients in the ICU, but also really important uh, to consider how we continue managing them when they leave the hospital and monitor them for risks of the therapy that we've given them, like bleeding. So with that, um, I am all done. So I'm going to pass, pass along to the following speakers. Thank you so much, Nicole. Okay, so um, just want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ald. Um, please, uh, we have two speakers that we're going to have uh, to talk about different aspects of hypercoagulability. If you have questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat um, as the talks continue, and we'll try to save some time at the end uh, for Q&A or after each speaker. Um, so Dr. Ald um, is a assistant professor at Emory. Um, she is in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and also the Department of Epidemiology. She's a clinician scientist and her research intersects uh, many areas, including global TB, HIV, clinical epidemiology, and translational pulmonary immunology. So we're, we're excited to have Sarah and we recruited her from she was an EIS fellow at the CDC and before that in Boston at Mass General. So Sarah has a K23 and an R21 investigating TB and HIV and um, immune responses, but she has been very instrumental in our COVID-19 response at Emory. Uh, not only is she taking on the front line taking care of these patients, but she has established a COVID-19 research consortium at Emory um, and a very large cohort um, that where they've been collecting large amounts of data. So I will now turn the stage over to her to discuss her data behind the hypercoagulable state in COVID-19. Sarah, if you can share your screen. Hi, um, good evening everybody. And thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this webinar and Sashma, thank you for that very kind introduction. As you can see, I'll be talking about COVID-associated hypercoagulability. You need to start with a few caveats. First is that this is a short talk, and it will cover some of what we know about hypercoagulability in COVID, but uh, this field is growing every day, and so this is by no means comprehensive. Second is that I am by no means a subject matter expert in the field. Rather, I benefited greatly from working over the last few months with a really wonderful smart collaborator group at Emory that's been focused on hypercoagulability, and I've had the chance to learn quite a lot from them. Sarah, I'm just going to interrupt you for just a second. It looks like there's a couple of comments in the chat about they can't hear you very well. Maybe just... All right. Um, I will try to really loud. I'm sorry about the audio. Um, Is that a little bit better for everybody? Okay. All right, we'll try that. That that sounds better for me. So okay, I will try to talk really loud. Thank My you. Not an expert. 
And so um, bear with me, but I've been working with some very smart people. And so for this short talk, I'll try to address a few questions. Um, first is whether there are indeed more clots in COVID. Second is why there might be more clots in COVID. And then third is what we can do about those clots in COVID. And then at the end, I'll put up some links to some of the society guidelines for reference, um, since I think it is important to keep those in mind. And so to start, are there more clots in COVID? I think this is a, a question that people are still really struggling with. Um, to answer it, I think it's worth keeping in mind that clot rates are historically in the 8 to 10% range in critically ill patients as you look at some of these data. Um, and so first, two studies from the Netherlands. In the first one, they studied 198 hospitalized patients, all of whom were on VTE prophylaxis. Um, 39 of those patients developed a VTE. The vast majority of those were inpatients in the ICU. And patients with a VTE had a more than twofold increase in their risk of death. Um, on the top right here, you can see the incidence of VTE over time in these um, ICU patients who are in red as compared to the ward patients in black. In the second study, they looked at 184 hospitalized patients, again, all of whom were on VTE prophylaxis. 75 of these patients had a thrombosis. The majority were PEs, um, but there were also seven arterial thrombi, which I think is worth noting. Among the ICU patients, there were 41 deaths, and the risk of death increased more than five-fold among those of clots. Um, in the graph on the bottom right, which again shows the cumulative incidence of thrombotic events over time, what I think stands out is that not only were there a great number of clots, but that they continued to accumulate over the 25 days that they studied. Here are two more studies from France. In the first, they looked at 150 patients admitted to the ICU with COVID. 70% of these patients were receiving VT prophylaxis, and the remaining 30% were on full treatment dose anticoagulation. Of note, 28 of 29 patients who required CRRT had circuit clotting, which was something that we also noted very early on in our Emory experience. And then they did a really neat analysis where they propensity matched these individuals to patients admitted in previous years with non-COVID ARDS. And with that analysis, they found rates of PE in COVID that were more than five-fold higher than in non-COVID times um, at 11.7% uh, as compared to 2.1%. On the right-hand side there, you can see some of the lab parameters that they looked at. They um, incidentally found actually lower D-dimer levels in COVID, which I think is in contrast to what's been reported in some other places, um, but higher fibrinogen and um, higher antithrombin levels. In a second study of 107 ICU patients, also from France, um, they found 22 patients had PE within a median of seven, six days, sorry, from ICU admission. And again, when they compare these to controls with a similar illness severity from a year earlier, from 2019, there were lower rates of PE in that control group. However, in the interest of presenting a balanced perspective, there have been some data indicating that these rates of thrombosis might not actually be higher in COVID. Um, first, there was a study from Italy of 388 hospitalized patients. They reported no DVTs, no symptomatic DVTs. And in a subset um, of 64 patients in whom they performed bilateral lower extremity ultrasound, they found no asymptomatic DVTs in that group either. Um, also, in an unpublished meta-analysis that was reviewed during a CHEF webinar a few weeks ago, they found uh, DVT and PE rates um, in both non-ICU and ICU patients to be in line in the same neighborhood as historical pre-COVID data. Um, of note, based on these data, the CHEF guidelines do recommend standard VT prophylaxis for COVID patients without modification. However, I do think that more and more data are accumulating supporting a higher incidence of clots in COVID. Um, and if that is the case, then why? First, um, just to recap a few things that we've seen in some autopsy studies that have come out, which do also support a high incidence of clotting. In one German study, seven of 12 patients had bilateral DVTs and four of seven patients also had a PE. In a study from Austria, all 11 patients that they looked at had thrombosis in their small and mid-sized pulmonary arteries. And then in another study from Germany, where they compared seven cases of COVID against seven historical cases with H1N1, um, they found widespread thrombosis, including nine times more alveolar capillary microthrombi COVID, which you can see there on the bottom right, as compared to H1N1. And so these start to indicate that the extent of um, endothelial injury might also be a unique or at least more pronounced feature in COVID as compared to other causes of ARDS. 
in a more recent autopsy series from NYU, they looked at seven patients, um, two of whom actually rested at home, and five of whom were admitted and intubated before they passed away. And they found platelet-rich thrombi in multiple vascular beds, not just in the lungs, but also in the liver, the kidneys, the heart, and circulating megakaryocytes in many of these sites. Um, these megakaryocytes, which can both produce and activate platelets, may be another aspect of COVID coagulopathy. Um, this series also found that four of the patients had pulmonary emboli and noted that they appeared to be in situ or having formed actually in the lungs rather than having migrated from the legs or elsewhere. Two of these PEs occurred in patients on therapeutic anticoagulation and one um, in a patient on prophylaxis. Um, I was also surprised to read that they found myocardial venous thromboses in two patients, which is obviously a rare occurrence. And notably, and in contrast to what I shared on the last slide, they did not report higher um, degrees of endothelial injury. And so it remains a little unclear what role that may play. And so what are at least some of the potential players and mechanisms that might be involved here? Um, and again, acknowledging that this list is in no way comprehensive, um, but I think um, worth walking through. First is the endothelial injury dysfunction um, that I've mentioned which again has been seen in some of these autopsy series, and I'll talk about briefly again on the next slide. There have also been numerous reports of lab abnormalities, including these high dimers, um, high levels of bottom factor antigen, uh, factor eight activity, high platelet counts. And while some of these are similar to what we're used to seeing in patients with DIC, unlike DIC, where bleeding really predominates, thromboses have certainly dominated the picture in COVID. The graphic on the right here, is from an early report from China where it was shown that patients who died had much higher C-dimer levels and that those did continue to go up over time in those patients who died. There's also been speculation about autoantibodies and whether these may play some role. Um, several reports have found lupus anticoagulant antibodies in up to 90% of patients. This is not a very specific finding and certainly more testing is needed to determine whether this simply reflects the overall inflammation that's going on in these patients or if it's playing a pathogenic role in helping to drive that hypercoagulability. Um, and then in a few slides, I'll briefly mention a recent report that found high rates of subtherapeutic anti 10 levels, which would make our standard um, prophylaxis and treatment regimens potentially less effective. And then after that, I'll talk about impaired fibrinolysis and fibrinolysis shutdown, circling back to some of the ideas that Nicole raised with our case presentation. And then the last item here, hyperviscosity and um, elevated fibrinogen levels will be covered by Cheryl Mayer, who's speaking next. And so this graphic and the title of the slide, actually, of Vasculature Unleashed is um, borrowed from a recent review where they focused on endothelial dysfunction and injury in COVID. And so endothelial injury, as I'm sure you're all aware, is one of the components of your child's triad, along with stasis of blood flow and hypercoagulability. And in this review, they looked at how endothelial cells are directly infected um, through the ACE2 receptor, which will then lead to endothelial cell dysfunction, release of inflammatory and platelet-activating cytokines, exposure of the basement membrane, which will be very thrombogenic, and all of that will sort of combine to lead to these high rates of clotting potentially. And that's obviously the clinical endpoint that we're going to be focused on. And then again, with, um, looking at the 10A levels, this is data from a UK study of 40 patients, 20 in the ICU and 20 on the general ward, all of whom were receiving low molecular heparin at prophylactic dosing. And a pretty astounding 95% of those in the ICU and nearly a third of those on the ward had sub-therapeutic anti levels. level. Um, this would suggest that some patients with COVID and potentially a great majority of those in the ICU may need higher doses of heparin in order to be effectively anticoagulated. And I think also put the onus on us to potentially monitor these patients a little more closely than we're used to doing in terms of those therapeutic levels. And then returning briefly to fibrinolysis shutdown with some data from Emory. Um, first, just to run through the graphic on the left here, which is borrowed from the trauma literature. This shows what can happen in terms of fibrinolytic activity after an injury, a traumatic injury. Patients who have hyperfibrinolysis, who are shown in that red line, as compared to those who have bound fibrinolysis, in the middle in that sort of green and yellow zone, and then those with fibrinolysis shut down in blue. These patients with fibrinolysis shut down will have trouble breaking down that clot once it's formed. And so we went back and reviewed records from 21 ICU patients who had had viscoelastic testing performed using the Rodin platform that Nicole reviewed, and 11 of those 21, so over half, had fibrinolysis shutdowns, 
which is defined as that ML or maximum life is was less than 3.5%. And I think even more noteworthy is that nine of the patients in the cohort had a clot, including eight of those with fibrinolysis shut down. And so it does seem to be contributing to some of the clinical events that we're seeing. And so last, what can we do about clots in COVID? First, there are emerging reports in the literature that anticoagulation does help. In China, where apparently VTE prophylaxis is not routine, um, like it is here in the US, there was a report showing lower 28-day mortality for those with a D-dimer, more than six times the upper limit of normal, who receive low molecular weight happen at prophylactic level. And you can see that in the top graphic, where mortality is plotted on the y-axis against the um, x-axis, which has various categories of D-dimer thresholds. Those who received heparin are in blue, and those who did not are in red. And as you go out to the right-hand side there, those with higher D-dimers, um, mortality was significantly lower for those who did receive heparin. Um, again, this is a prophylactic dosing. There was also a brief report um, from Mount Sinai where they looked at nearly 3,000 hospitalized patients, including almost 400 in the ICU. And they found that treatment dose anticoagulation was associated with an adjusted hazard ratio for death of 0.86, with no increase in bleeding notice. On the right-hand side there, you can see the survival curves for those who did not receive therapeutic anticoagulation in red versus those who did in blue. The patients on the left-hand side of that graphic are all the patients who were admitted, whereas only those requiring mechanical ventilation are on the right. And in that one, you see an even greater separation of those curves, potentially indicating greater benefit in those who are more critically ill. As Nicole mentioned at Emory, we adopted a tiered approach to VT prophylaxis back in early April. Um, this was after reading some of these early reports pointing towards hyperhidrosability and some of the prognostic value of D-dimer for the first level, which includes those without a known clot and with a D-dimer less than 3,000, which, uh, which is six times the upper limit of normal um, with our assay. We recommended standard prophylaxis of low molecular weight heparin at 0.5 mg per kg per day, or the equivalent thereof. For the second level, um, which is those without a known clot and with a D-dimer above 3,000, above that threshold, we recommended doubling that dose um, or dosing twice a day. And then for the third level, which is for those with known or suspected thrombosis, um, which we did leave pretty broad to allow for some clinical discretion, um, we recommend standard therapeutic dosing. Um, and if note, and Nicole mentioned this as well, we also put on discharge recommendations out of concern that these patients remain hypercoagulable for a time after their acute illness. And just to circle back to one of the questions that had come up in the quiz, for those who um, are being discharged from that level three with known or suspected VT, we do um, encourage them to have follow-up either in hematology or pulmonary clinic um, at four to six weeks after discharge. Uh, since we made these initial guidelines, we've had a chance to look through some of our own data, and we've been gratified to see that these thresholds have borne out as clinically relevant from what we've found so far. Um, at the bottom here, you can see a graph with D-dimer levels plotted over time since admission for patients who did and did not have an incident VTE. A value above 3,000 at any point during hospitalization carried a 15-fold increase in the odds of developing a VTE and an increase of more than um, of 2,000 or more, sorry, during a 24-hour period carried a more than four-fold increase in the odds of developing a VTE. And finally, I just want to briefly mention a new service we've created um, called the COVID, uh, Consult Team for COVID-19 Coagulopathy, or CTCC, we're calling it. We modeled it after the PE response teams and pulled together a multidisciplinary group with folks from hematology, critical care, cardiology, anesthesia, vascular surgery, pharmacy, and pathology. And the idea is if clinicians have a difficult case um, with what we've taken to call refractory hypercoagulability, this group is available to weigh in on things like failure of anticoagulation and whether switching to something like a um, direct vomit inhibitor might be indicated. Or if there's evidence of fibrinolysis shutdown, um, whether to consider fibrinolytic and um, some of the dosing options for that. Or, and as you'll hear about more in a moment, um, if someone has hyperviscosity, whether plasma exchange could be useful. Um, and then in closing, and again out of recognition that much of what I've discussed does not have the strength of randomized controlled trials behind it, I've put up links here to some of the National Society guidelines. Um, the NIH guidelines haven't been updated since early May, but 
At that time, they stated that there was insufficient evidence to recommend for or against the use of thrombolytics or increasing anticoagulant doses for VT prophylaxis. Um, with that said, I think that every clinician and every system needs to look at the evidence that is and isn't available um, and their patient population and decide what they're comfortable with and what they think um, will work well for their setting. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you again for giving me a, the opportunity to present and hand things back to Sushma. Thanks so much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. Um, we did have one question in the chat, but I'm going to save that until after Cheryl's talk. That's okay. Um, again, if you have questions, please post them in the chat and I will keep track of them. Um, and we'll try to save just a little bit of time at the end. So, um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Cheryl Mayer, who is also an assistant professor at Emory University. Uh, Dr. Mayer did her medical scientist training program at Yale. Uh, before she came to Emory for her residency. She currently has a K99 and an ROO um, and spends most of her time doing basic research in platelet immunology um, and some of her time doing clinical hemostasis and transfusion medicine. She's also the medical director of Emory's Special Coagulation Lab um, and has been working very closely with Dr. Ald on sort of our system-wide COVID anticoagulation protocols and data collections um, and research. So I'm going to uh, transfer the slides over to Dr. Mayer. So Cheryl, if you can share your slides. Well, thank you, uh, Shoshma, for the kind introduction and uh, also uh, to everyone for the opportunity to talk to this group this evening. Um, I just wanted to start off by um, putting into context um, why we decided to look at, um, at hyperviscosity in these patients. And uh, I think as, as uh, Dr. Ald has already given a great introduction into kind of the coagulopathy that we've been seeing in COVID-19, I really wanted to hone in on uh, the patients that have what we've been calling refractory hypercoagulability. And when we talk about like the atypical clotting that these patients are having, it's not just that they clot despite being therapeutically anticoagulated. Um, really what a lot of the clinicians were seeing on the front lines were that the clots themselves were something uh, that hadn't really been seen before. So uh, clotting of the CRRT circuits with this kind of jelly gelatinous like um, substance. Uh, we also saw this in the clinical lab uh, in laboratory specimens um, and just sort of something that that seemed like it wasn't necessarily uh, the types of clots that we were used to dealing with. And being on the lab side of things, one thing that I was really surprised by was how our traditional biomarkers of coagulation were generally unremarkable. So the kind of normal standard labs that we would use to decide whether someone was therapeutically anticoagulated or not looked as if they were being suppressed. And so because of this, and considering kind of uh, Verkau's triad, um, it didn't seem quite like hypercoagulability could explain why these patients were actually having thrombosis. So in addition to that, we were also a little bit surprised by the relatively normal platelet counts in these patients and the extreme hyperfibrinogenemia. And that's just because in some ways these patients did have a somewhat of a DIC-like picture, but unlike DIC, which is a very consumptive process with low platelet counts and low fibrinogen, um, the, the most remarkable bit of the laboratory data was this extreme hyperfibrinogenemia. So fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. It's made by the liver in response to inflammatory cytokines, uh, principally IL-6. And normally the, the reference range, it's going to depend, you know, what lab you're in, but in ours, it's about 200 to 400. And what was surprising is that in a number of patients with refractory hypercoagulability, they were at least twice the upper limit of normal. So it was not uncommon to see a patient who was at 800, 900, even over 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. And that really is something um, that, that we just don't see in other diseases. Certainly, this was not something that we noted just at Emory. So even earlier on in the pandemic, um, others kind of uh, uh, honed in on this high fibrinogen um, and found that uh, not only is it elevated, but it is uh, very strongly associated with, with IL-6. 
And then more recently, um, a group from, from China has reported on how the increased fibrinogen levels on admission are actually associated with severe disease. And in fact, a low fibrinogen to albumin ratio can uh, exclude uh, the development of severe disease uh, in these patients. So I promise this is the, the only coagulation cascade type uh, slide that I will show uh, to this group. But I did just want to uh, remind everyone that you know, fibrinogen is um, a very important piece of the coag cascade. Uh, it's cleaved into uh, fibrin monomers by thrombin. And fibrin monomers are important because they really are the building blocks of clot. And so even though we spend a lot of time talking about fibrin and, and, and its development and, and kind of resulting in clot formation, even just having high fibrinogen in and of itself can be prothrombotic. And I think this is a nice schematic. It was um, uh, published about a year ago, kind of showing all the different ways that fibrinogen uh, might actually uh, kind of uh, lend uh, towards a prothrombotic phenotype. And so you see fibrinogen directly interacts with platelets to promote aggregation. It also will uh, bind to endothelial cells and increase vascular permeability. Um, it also, uh, as Sarah was talking and, um, and Nicole both about fibrinolysis shutdown, uh, what happens when you have high levels of fibrinogen is that the composition of the clot is fundamentally different than when you have normal levels of fibrinogen. And this actually renders the thrombus uh, resistant to fibrinolysis. Um, so endogenous TPA, even if it's there, is not going to be able to work as effectively. Uh, in addition to that, fibrinogen is just a very large, very sticky protein. And so if you have a lot of it uh, circulating in the blood, uh, it stands to reason that just the, the sheer size and abundance of it might increase the stickiness or the viscosity um, of, of the blood. I can do this not only by just kind of the physical presence, but also in its interaction uh, with red blood cells. So when we talk about hyperviscosity, there's kind of two components uh, we can classify it into. Uh, one is whole blood hyperviscosity, and then the other is plasma hyperviscosity, which also will increase whole blood, hyper, uh, whole blood viscosity. Uh, when we talk about whole blood viscosity, this is really related to changes in cellular components. So increases in red cells, for example, in P. vera, or in white cells in different types of leukemias, uh, as well as uh, diseases uh, like sickle cell disease, where you have decreased uh, cellular deformity. And then increases in plasma viscosity are really just related to increases in the plasma proteins themselves. So this being immunoglobulins or fibrinogen. And most commonly when we think about hyperviscosity, and especially if you think about hyperviscosity syndrome, you're going to associate this with hypergamma globulinemia, uh, either from Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia or in multiple myeloma. And I'd like to point out that in those diseases, uh, symptomatic hyperviscosity is considered a medical emergency. And even though there's not an exact threshold at which patients become symptomatic, um, it's generally somewhere about three and a half or four centipoise. And when patients are symptomatic, even at lower thresholds, um, we do go ahead and do therapeutic plasma exchange. Um, and then hyperfibrinogenemia, you know, I did stick a, a reference on here in case that people are interested in looking at this, but this is really something where the literature is quite dated. Um, they looked in uh, uh, rheumatologic patients and found very strong correlation between plasma viscosity and the level of fibrinogen, um, but it really, it's not something that we pay attention to in most inflammatory states uh, these days. So we actually decided to look at plasma viscosity in a handful of patients that were critically ill in our ICU. And what I'm showing in this graphic is uh, basically the plasma viscosity plotted against patient SOFA scores. And just for your own reference, the normal reference range of viscosity is from 1.4 to 1.8 centipoise in, in our lab. And you can see that uh, every patient that we checked uh, was actually outside of our normal range. And you'll notice that the patients that were the sickest, that had the highest SOFA scores, they also had the highest plasma viscosities, and those were also the patients that had known thrombotic complications. We also looked at fibrinogen and plotted that against viscosity since these patients had very high fibrinogen levels. And um, what we found is that there is definitely a, a strong positive correlation 
uh, but it's not quite as strong as what we see when we plot the viscosity against the SOFA scores. So suggesting that there may be additional plasma proteins that are also driving the viscosity. Uh, certainly antibodies, you know, could be involved since this is, you know, these are patients who are mounting a very active immune response and especially a lot of IgM. Um, but then even other sticky proteins, uh, things like fiber monomers, von Willebrand, um, and, and factor VIII may also be contributing to this. So we know that hyperviscosity uh, is a risk factor for thrombosis. Um, it alters blood flow and activates uh, the endothelium. This is mostly related to uh, increases in the resistance to flow. So I show this graphic over here of honey. You can imagine uh, it's very different if you're pumping something that's a little bit more like honey or, or molasses or syrup um, as compared to um, more uh, blood-like, uh, which would be something like water. Um, and this is uh, kind of a problem um, in, for a number of reasons, but one is that if, you're, if you have sticky blood, uh, you're having a lot of stasis in the small vessels. And so this actually uh, kind of lends to the propensity to, to have clots forming in the small vessels. And then at the same time, uh, if you have sludgy blood, uh, you're not perfusing your organs um, as you should be. And so this can actually contribute to end organ damage. When we test for this, um, we, we've been doing uh, plasma viscosity, and I include this here just uh, for this group in case you go back to your home institutions and decide to uh, monitor viscosity in your own patients. Uh, just make sure that you really are looking at plasma viscosity and not serum viscosity. We often uh, use serum viscosity when measuring patients that have high immunoglobulin, like in Waldenstrom's, um, but you'll remember the difference between serum and plasma is the removal of the clotting factors, including fibrinogen. So while the levels of fibrinogen in these patients are actually so high that some of it does spill over into the serum, you won't actually capture the full degree of the hyperviscosity if you just measure the serum. Uh, in addition, as Nicole pointed out, there are also some clinical assessments for hyperviscosity, uh, looking for that kind of what we call the smoke signal um, by, um, by ultrasound. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm going to share some data with you on the first patients um, in which we've actually been doing therapeutic plasma exchange uh, at, at Emory. So we, um, we are not the first to suggest that there may be a benefit of doing plasma exchange in COVID. Uh, there have been a number of reports that have positive that there might be a beneficial role. Um, but most of these studies, you know, they're, they're speculative. Uh, and they're actually, they're not studies. They're just uh, reports uh, kind of saying that maybe uh, if we could decrease some of the inflammatory markers, we may actually be able to improve outcomes. And so we... Um, found that once we, we, once we knew about the hyperviscosity, and since hyperviscosity is uh, an approved uh, reason you know, that you would wanna do uh, plasma exchange, we thought this was kind of providing the unique rationale to go ahead and pull the trigger to do it in some of these patients. Um, so I'm gonna share data, um, which is just a very, very preliminary report of the first six patients uh, that we've done exchange in, um, and we are now up to 14 patients. Um, but basically, in all of the patients, we uh, were able to significantly decrease not only their plasma viscosity, but their fibrinogen, their D-dimer, uh, and their CRP. Unfortunately, the two sickest patients uh, in this group uh, died. And so over here in the, um, in the uh, figure, I'm showing you uh, the SOFA scores before TPE. And those two that had uh, the highest SOFA scores, they don't have a matched uh, post-TPE uh, measure, um, unfortunately, uh, succumbed to disease. But in the four um, other patients, we actually did see a clinical improvement. And I'm gonna at least uh, highlight one um, that is the patient that Nicole uh, has already uh, shared with you. Um, but this has a few additional uh, laboratory parameters. So you can see in this patient, they had um, in that, that middle um, line, really high sustained uh, levels of fibrinogen. They had an acute increase in, in their D-dimer. Um, there was, you, know, you can see the broken access, so the patient's peak was up at 22,000, um, and very high levels of, of CRP. Once we did the two rounds of therapeutic plasma exchange, uh, the patient's uh, laboratory parameters uh, normalized. Um, this is not uh, very surprising because as, as I like to say, it's kind of like changing the oil. So uh, you put in some, some new good stuff, of course, all the laboratory parameters are going to come down. Um, but what was more important was, was the clinical course that this patient had. They were able to be extubated four days after the final procedure um, and ultimately ended up being discharged um, without any supplemental oxygen. Um, so kind of a, a, a dramatic uh, improvement. This is looking at the laboratory values of all six patients in that first group, um, just to show you that um, pre and post uh, TPE, the plasma viscosity comes down uh, and essentially normalizes. 
fibrinogen levels uh, decreased, the dimer decreased, and in all but one patient, uh, the CRP also decreased. So I think uh, just to summarize, uh, you know, I think uh, that COVID-19 uh, certainly has a very unique pathogenesis, especially uh, in, in the coagulopathy that's associated with it. Uh, we do think that hyperviscosity and hyperfibrinogenemia may be contributing uh, to these patients who have refractory hypercoagulability. And then I'd even extend that to say, uh, potentially, because of what we know about hyperviscosity, it might also uh, result in or organ damage. Uh, we're still trying to understand, you know, if there is a beneficial role for uh, plasma exchange. There have been a few uh, patients that, uh, that show a really promising improvement. Um, and really, we need large trials to, to decide whether or not this is something uh, that will provide any benefit in management. And uh, we actually are uh, just about to uh, begin a randomized control trial at our center uh, looking, looking at this. Um, and so I would just say, you know, plasma exchange does have this unique advantage of getting rid of all these big sticky bad things um, and then uh, addition of the good and that being the antibodies. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are following uh, the, the reports of the use of convalescent plasma in patients. And one of the nice things about plasma exchange is that um, we can actually use convalescent plasma at the end of the exchange as, as the last products going in to give patients um, uh, the, kind of the, the, the benefit of, of both therapies. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayer. Um, so there are a few questions in the chat um, that I wanted to pose to all of you, whoever wants to take them. Um, the most recent question that came out was what the criteria for offering the patient therapeutic plasma exchange. Do you have set criteria and how are you guys proceeding with that at the hospital? So um, basically, as, as Sarah introduced, we have a, a consult service. So uh, clinicians that are taking care of patients in, uh, in the ICU or, or anywhere um, can consult hematology. And then uh, hematology will kind of use our algorithm uh, to decide if it's a, a clear case um, where, you know, for example, systemic TPA would be used if it's a patient with fibrinolysis shutdown versus plasma exchange if they clearly are, um, are hyperviscous. Um, but in these cases, you know, they oftentimes don't fit uh, particularly well into the algorithm. Um, sometimes there's patients where you can't find clot, but you think it's there. Um, and so uh, for some of these more challenging cases, uh, hematology will go ahead and, uh, and involve uh, the entire multidisciplinary team uh, that, that Sarah has assembled. And so we have um, experts uh, spanning all, uh, a number of fields, I think nine different specialties or so, um, and we kind of come up with a plan that's catered uh, specifically to, to those patients. And how many sessions of Plex have you done on those patients? So, um, so we've done 14 patients uh, so far. Um, all but one have had two sessions of TPE and one patient had a third. Um, we found that, that two has actually uh, been very, very um, effective. And, and several of the patients uh, that get the two rounds actually have sustained lowering in their fibrinogen um, and, and, and normalization of the viscosity even, even at later time points. Um, and that's the, the regimen that we'll be using in the trial as well. We had a session, uh, question early on that I don't want to miss about um, inhaled EPO, epoprostenol, and whether or not it's part of um, the protocol. Um, and there was a, another aspect to that. Are you expecting some inhibitory effects on platelet aggregation in addition to pulmonary vasodilator effect, and is there any data on IV EPO? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Uh, sorry, so we have not incorporated inhaled EPO into our protocol. Um, and I think the role of platelets in class in COVID remains controversial in my mind. I think there are some evidence supporting it um, within our own data, and Cheryl can speak to this because she's in the lab, but we've been looking at um, platelet activity levels, and they have, they have not been particularly high, nor have platelet counts been particularly high, although there again are theories that have found otherwise. So in our local context, we have not used inhaled EPO um, as a sort of antiplatelet effect. And in fact, in a, a few patients in whom we've added antiplatelet therapy, we have had some bleeding complications, so it's made us take pause a little bit. So um, there is another question asking about thoughts on the utility 
of prolonged R and K times in, in TEG and using that to start therapeutic anticoagulation. Yeah, reduced times. Thanks, Casey. That's what I thought too. <laughs> so using your TEG uh, for the R and K and how have you been incorporating that to change your anticoagulation strategies? So I think one of the challenges is that these tests aren't as easily available as some of the other things we have, which was why we really went with the D-dimer as the major threshold that we use. I think for um, folks who have easy access to thromboelastography or viscoelastic testing and um, are able to incorporate those, it's certainly another useful data point. Um, but for example, of the Emory hospitals, the one that I work at doesn't actually have viscoelastic testing. And so we're unable to access they would like to shut down or um, some of these other times. Um, and then there was another question about um, saline, um, asking if saline would work instead of TPE. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I, I think maybe you're asking um, about uh, doing like, um, like, um, uh, acute normal volume, how, what's the hemodilution, acute, what, yeah, ANH <laughs> that they do in, 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 the, in the OR. Um, maybe that's um, that word is what someone's suggesting. Um, certainly, um, you know, doing a procedure like that um, will kind of thin what is, what is there um, in, the, in the kind of um, rawest, rawest sense of, of it. Um, but I think you're still not removing all of the substrate. And that's one of, um, one of the major concerns is that even if it's thinned, you still have a lot of it there. And I will, I will say, you know, it might not be like the positive effect that we've seen um, in a number of our patients. It might not be just the decrease in fibrinogen because we, you know, we see IL-6 levels come down and, and a lot of these inflammatory mediators are, are decreased. And so it seems um, to be a good thing to remove um, as, as much of it as possible. I will say, just going to add volume too, probably. Exactly. Oh, that's, that's definitely true. Um, one of the things that we've also uh, considered a lot in, in these patients um, with plasma exchange is uh, what type of replacement we would be doing. So typically, like in a, in a hyper gamma globulinemia uh, patient where we're just removing antibody, we would be replacing with albumin. And, um, you know, this is just a different, uh, different entity because these patients, a lot of them seem to have just a little bit of liver injury. Uh, they're also on um, pretty, uh, you know, high dose anticoagulation. And so we, we had a lot of discussion about using albumin or even using cryopore plasma because it doesn't have fibrinogen and von Willebrand and factor eight and all those sticky things. Um, but in these patients, then, you're, then what you're repleting them with um, doesn't have either the pro or the anticoagulants uh, that, that would normally be there. And, and, and they're anticoagulated, and some of them are on an antiplatelet. And so we've actually um, been, been using plasma and, and had really good, um, really good results with that. Fibrinogen still comes down um, and, and a number of other markers as well. So for all of you, there's been some recent information that's come out about blood types. Um, what are your thoughts about blood type A patients being more hypercoagulable or at higher risk? Um, one of our audience has also asked that question. So, so this is, yeah, this is, it's a fascinating, it's fascinating area. You know, the, the effect has been uh, generally small, um, but I think there's, there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot more to it than we than we understand. I think, you know, the um, the the glycosylation of of um, of the of the you know it, it's not just you know we we talk about blood type, but really those those uh, those sugars are on a number of cells. They're on our endothelium, and so in a disease where you know endothelial damage. Um, potentially uh, damage the glycocalyx, which also has um, some of those some of those sugar structures. Um, I think I think the jury's still out, but you can certainly come up with a number of theoretical reasons uh, why there might be a propensity in some patients um, versus in others. And I'll just add that we have not been able to do those analyses locally, so we don't have data to add on whether there's an association between blood type and clotting. 
Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, if you had to give the audience a tip, your best tip for managing these patients clinically and dealing with the hypercoagulable state, what would you recommend? Having a protocol for now based on D-dimer and making sure that all your patients are getting the right anticoagulation treatments or in your limited experience, what has been the most effective? I think there's the balance of sort of the patient in front of you versus the um, overall institutional approach. And I think from an institutional level, having um, thresholds where you might consider, and again, it's at the discretion of the clinician, higher doses of anticoagulation um, can be useful. You know, we are doing analyses now to look at the impact of the guidelines that we started that was six weeks into our experience taking care of COVID patients to see whether there were improvements in clinical endpoints. Certainly anecdotally, um, it feels like we're seeing a little bit less renal injury. Um, certainly the clotting of CRT surface has gone down a bit. And then for the individual patients who um, might be particularly difficult, I think that the ability to tap into a broad-ranging group of experts has been really valuable for us. And I think has um, let us pull together a group of people who have very diverse backgrounds and try to think about what might be best again for that individual patient. Yeah, I agree. It's very complicated and changing all the time, it seems like. So. OK, well, we are over. It's 9.15. So I would like to thank you guys again all for coming. It's such an important topic. Thank you for taking time out of your evening um, and your family time to come and do this for everybody. So really appreciate it. Um, thank you again. All right, and we will end. Please fill out the survey for the audience. Bye, everybody.